Thanks for that great intro, Zach. Got to bring you on the road with me more often. Um, great to be here. Um, let me just kick it off. Quick little quiz here in the morning. If I can get this to go. There we go. Who's the salesperson in this picture? Is it the good looking, money hungry gentleman on the left? Or the helpful young lady on the right? Is it the sleazy cigar smoker? Or is it the thoughtful academic? Is it the devil? Or is it the doctor? It's humorous. But if you do a search in Google Images for salesperson, every image on the left shows up. And none of the images on the right. That is absurd. How did that happen? Like, uh, whatever it was, 100 years ago, we created this function called sales. And today, who, these people who are supposed to go out and represent our businesses, our brands, to our prospective customers, are known as money-hungry, sleazy cigar smokers, and not thoughtful, helpful um, professionals. And the question is, is that going to change? If you've been to a conference in the last two years, you've probably all seen, seen the data. Absolutely. As buyers today, we felt this ourselves. We are 100% empowered with this information age, the internet. And there's big arguments that we don't even need salespeople anymore. Pick a study, right? Corporate executive board, Harvard Business Review, chief sales officer, more, almost 60% of buying journeys are done before they even engage with a sales team, right? Um, most of these journeys, 90%, start in social media, the web, et cetera. And so that's sort of our opening journey here is um, I believe the, the biggest innovations around selling start with innovations in buying. And we want to kick off and understand that modern buyer and impact on, on your world. Um, so um, I've probably done 50 RFPs in my life. I haven't done one in the last couple of years, so I'll have to rely on you on that portion, but we have an eclectic group here. We have people who are running sales teams, we have people who are sellers, we have marketers, we have people who only do RFPs. And so the one thing we all have in common is we deal with buyers. And that's really what I wanna lay out here, and I've studied quite a bit in the last few years how that impacts selling. I haven't studied how it impacts responding to RFPs. Um, but I, I hope that we can take away some of these um, these transformations and apply it to our world, whatever that might be. Okay? I think as sales organizations, we're at fault on what I just showed you in terms of how we've defined our, our sales teams. And I simplify it as sort of, we think about selling as this inside out approach. We think about selling as, okay, I dreamed up this company with this offering and this product and this is what it does and let me list all that out and build a beautiful PowerPoint presentation and a website and tell my salespeople to go out and, and talk to buyers about what this thing does. And things become a lot more logical and align with the modern buyer when we start the outside in. We don't focus much energy on what our product does and what our offering is and what our company does, but instead on who this buyer is and what their number one challenges, opportunities, goals are before they even know about our offering. Right? And so this, this first part is so bad, we have words for this, show up and throw up. That's what, that's what people call, 80% like of salespeople are show up and throw up. They show up and, and just basically tell me everything that's on the website. Or alligator selling, big mouth, little ears. Like 80% of sellers are like that. And, and you know, that's what we've got to move away from. Here's the data from this really cool company in San Francisco called Gong.io. They basically are, um, they do artificial intelligence. They have an artificial intelligence algorithm that listens to sales calls to figure out what's happening. And this particular study, um, they listened to 50,000 sales calls across 5,000 companies, I think. And what they did was they separated those calls into the top performing reps versus the bottom. Right, so top performing reps are talking 46% in that first meeting. Bottom performing reps are talking 72%. It's stuff anecdotally we've known forever in the world of sales, but now the data is speaking to us. This is how it's progressing. On the top is what the top performing salespeople are doing. They're asking between 11 and 14 questions through the call. Bottom performing reps are asking all the questions up front. 
Right? They're changing, top performing reps are changing the speaker every three minutes, it's engaging. And, and this is how it looks like. This is a, a five to 10 minutes of an opening rapport building. It's three or four business issues, not features. And then it's establishing the next steps, right? So where we've got to do, uh, progress to, companies that are, that are modern sellers build their sales process on top of the buying journey. I don't think if, if you are going after RFPs or if you're doing um, technology responses, I don't think that's different. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of challenge you on how we can actually bridge that gap. All right, so codifying this, what does that actually mean? It means we start with the buying journey. We start with the buying journey, and that's the first thing that our salespeople understand, not our product. And so here's an example of buying journey, very simple. Awareness, consideration, decision. Right, so at the awareness stage, what are the problems, the challenges, the opportunities that our buyers are going after before they know about our product? What are the, what are so the solutions that, categories that they're considering? And then how do they make that decision? Are they going after the cheapest? Are they going after the most robust? Are they going after the one with the best security? I had a lot of conversation with you folks last night that RFPs was largely a procurement process going after the cheapest price. And now it's evolved quite a bit to be around value. And so understanding which values are prioritized, do we truly do, we truly do that? Does our sales team do that? Do they communicate that to us? Do we embed that in our responses? I'm not sure. This is the particular example from uh, an $8 billion revenue organization out in Europe. They sell um, uh, innovation software. And so what these folks do is they help teams um, to develop products faster, more efficiently in their R&P functions. So this particular, uh, this innovation, if you, if you see this, their, their particular customers have different uh, needs. Like some of them just want to reduce the time to market for producing products. Others want to increase collaboration. You're having a session on collaboration later, you can relate to that. And so how they solve that, some of them want to buy software to do it, some of them want to do it internally, some of them want to use their ERP system. And if they want to buy software, some are looking for the cheapest, some are looking for the most robust, some are looking for the most innovative company. Now my first objective as a sales team is understanding where my buyer is on their journey. Because I can sell someone no matter what box they're in. Right? If they want to reduce time to market and they're going to build their own software to do it, or if they want to improve product quality and they're going to buy a product to do it and they're looking for the cheapest one, that, neither of those buyers are aligned with me. If I just fill out an RFP, I'm going to lose. But I can win that deal by reframing that perspective. And I just need to know what game I'm playing first. Right? And so rooting the sales process and the buying journey helps us to understand how to play that game. This is another example. Anyone heard of Tiny Pulse? This is a company based in Seattle. What they do is, uh, they're a little more robust than this, but they have a quick um, survey that, you, that automatically goes out to your, all your employees every week. How happy are you in your job? One to 10, why or why not? And this is something that people are using, the Boston Red Sox, Facebook, et cetera. They're using it to quantify their culture. Okay, so that's essentially what they do. And so you can see here, like, people buy for all different reasons. Some people have really bad culture and they want to improve it. Some people have high turnover. Some people want to maintain their culture. And what they've done here is they've extended their buyer journey to the success layer. Right? So not just how you're going to actually buy the product, but how are you going to define success? Which I think is so critical. They do this pre-sales to have an agreement with the buyer on what exactly we're going after. And to you know, go through uh, an RFP process without understanding that, I think is a, is a very dangerous game to play. And there are some levels of success that are realistic and some that are not. And I wanna make sure pre-sale I've got them understood. Well, all right, so we made a mistake on this actually. And I think there's a, there's a parallel to the RFP stage of, of, of buying uh, with this particular story at HubSpot. It was year three. And for the first time, we introduced a free trial. Okay, so we had been selling, and we've been trying to you know, work through the buyer journey, understand where people are, do really good discovery, not do show up and throw up, not do alligator selling, but try to be good modern sellers. And our sales team was psyched, because we introduced a free trial for the first time. So all of a sudden, this new wave of leads started to come in. 
Not just people who downloaded white papers, but people who were actually using the product. They were in a tribe. And so our salespeople were like, this is fantastic. This is gonna save me so much more time. I don't have to do three calls with these people anymore. I'm gonna basically call them up and take orders. And they called up all these free trials and they showed them how to use the product. They did like 500 of these, no one bought. No one bought. And we were like, what the heck is going on? And as we reflected, we looked at this thing and we realized we thought they were there when they went in the trial. But they weren't. They were all the way back here. And it wasn't until one of our reps was like, you know what? I'm just going to treat these free trials as if it's just a really good lead. And I'm going to go through all the same process of like, hey, listen, not just teach them how to use the trial, but why did you even download the product? What are you trying to do? Before we get into it, and they back right back into a very similar process. And then the free trials became our best leads. And that was my experience with the RFPs as well. Is, you know, there, there's all this talk about the RFPs are just way too specific around features. Like, most people don't even know why specific questions are an RFP, who the heck put it in there. And we've totally lost sight of the business value that we're trying to actually create. And so my experience is when I get an RFP, yeah, fine. It means they're serious about a purchase, but the magic happens when I take a step back and try to understand the value behind that. So, so that, you know, I think this buying journey, this modern buyer, this understanding leads into this process as well, is if we jump to the response, we may not be aligned with the modern buyer. And to not let this be a signal to think that it's way deeper and to take the step backs and not, not skip steps can help us succeed more with this, okay? So let's just talk about, what, okay, fine, I've got this buyer journey, and fine, like maybe we can retrain our sales teams to define the first step as not what does the product do, but understand where the buyer's in the journey, fine. Now how does this affect my sales process? How does it affect the way I prospect? How does it affect the way I do discovery? So let's look at uh, prospecting for a second. Here's actually a company that does consulting for Shopify, uh, an awesome company out of this region actually. And so this, this company has built a whole consulting practice around helping e-commerce companies use Shopify, which is an e-commerce solution. So they got, wrote a beautiful blog article about this new Shopify Plus. They had this awesome call to action at the end around watching a webinar, very aligned with the buyer journey, beautiful. So I go in here and I download this thing and I get a call from the salesperson. Okay. And so this is what a not modern seller does, is there's no awareness of my experience so far. Hi, Michelle. This is Dwight from ICT. We specialize in ready to sell e-commerce websites, you know, et cetera. And not only do they, this is no awareness of like what I was interested in and what I was doing from a modern selling standpoint, but they leave the same freaking voicemail every single time. You guys are getting these voicemails, right? Like I literally had someone call me last week, do you have a crack in your windshield? I said, no, they hung up the phone. Like that's their job all day. I mean, why, why are we doing this? Are your salespeople doing this? Most voicemails I get sound like this. And so the opportunity that we have is to really rethink how we go about even this basic premise of prospecting, how we rethink maybe respond to RFPs, going through the tech survey, through this process, because yes, our buyers have more information about us, but as sellers, we have more information about them. And, do, and can we learn it? Every single meeting I do, whether it's a sales call or meeting my kids' teachers or meeting like the guy I'm gonna coach football with this season, I go to their LinkedIn page and learn about them. Right, and that's the first step in modern prospecting is who the heck am I dealing with? Because if this person has been at the company for six months versus six years, that's a big difference. If they're CFO or CEO or CMO, that's a big difference. I can tell a lot from what they studied in school, what they're posting on their, on their um, social media, what they're interested in. I know for a fact that a big four consulting firm is having this be the first step of their RFP response process, is they've codified the research that they can do on their particular buyers. I actually, this is actually um, a woman's company that I was, uh, I actually ended up investing in um, and I was looking at investments. Sometimes my, my kids are along for the ride with me and I had to do this call while I was on a long drive with my 11-year-old son. 
And I said, listen, bud, I'm sorry, I need to do this call for 30 minutes, but you can listen in and sometimes they get interested and they'll maybe learn a little something. So he's like, oh, who's the call with? I'm like, oh, it's this woman actually, Michelle, actually, here, here's my phone. This is her LinkedIn profile. Why don't you check out her background and tell me what you think? And he like looks it over. And a minute later, he's like, Dad, you know, her background looks awesome. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, look, there's like a bridge and an ocean. <laughs> it's a really cool building. So, like, so that was like one of his first lessons on doing diligence. Um, so it's not just, it's not just the, the stuff there, but also these people are doing stuff with our companies. And this is another thing that the big four consulting company is doing as well. Is they're exposing to their RFP teams not just the public information available, but all the information that we're tracking on our customers. Like what emails are they opening? What pages on our website are they looking at? What have they called support on to ask? And these are enormous insights into what they're not telling us about what they're truly getting at. And to really help on a, on a deeper level. And then finally to embed that in the process. So this is what a better seller does in response to that webinar download. Hi Michelle, this is Ryan from ICT. I noticed you attended our webinar on, Shop on Shopify Plus. I took a look at your company's e-commerce function. I have a couple tips. If you want to give me a call, I'll send them to you over email and we can discuss. And then two days later, by the way, Michelle, I was thinking of you. Um, here's a customer of ours who looks like they're in the same space. I want to send you over the case study. Michelle, two days later, I was thinking of you again. Um, th this is actually one of our eBooks that we wrote that was similar to the webinar. And then finally, for the sales leaders in the room, um, the one that has the biggest callback rate is the breakup email. It's the biggest callback rate, no joke. 30% callback rate, it's ridiculous. She's like, Michelle, you know, thanks for the time. You know, I, you, I haven't heard back from you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and assume that you figured out your optimization for e-commerce. If you ever change your mind, give me a call, I'm here to help. That one has, the, I don't know why. You, you folks are buyers, um, you can tell me, maybe they, but you can see that this is a dialogue that's worth listening to. The other person, I hear their name, I delete the voicemail. What this person is someone, maybe I just don't have time to get to them, but I'm appreciating the value that they're getting. Huh? And so, you know, let's just keep that in mind for RFPs. Is like, are you jumping right into the response? Are you taking the time to learn about the buyer? Right, we talked about learning about the buyer journey, and that's our first step. We can learn a lot about the buyer journey before we even talk to them to figure out what this perspective looks like. Okay. And then, so anyway, this is what actually a um, prospecting guy would look like, is it defines how you're gonna follow up on what day, et cetera. And this is what modern sales teams are actually putting together. Discovery, okay. So this is, now once we get up the meeting, obviously the first meeting is not show up and throw up. The first meeting is understanding why. And so obviously you can't read this here, but this is actually a discovery guide. I put it there as an example because I like a one pager if I have an inside sales team, it's sitting in front of my reps and they can follow it or I can bring it to a meeting and I can follow it. This is not a script. This is just the sequences of the discovery meeting with some example questions for a salesperson to rely on as they're going through it. Because believe me, it is a lot easier to show up to that first meeting and just give a presentation. And that's what 80% of salespeople do. And I showed you the data. You're a bottom performer if you do that. You've got to go in and get them talking. And that's stressful. And you've got to listen. And you've got to be dynamic. But it's not as hard as you think. It's not as hard as you think. People love to talk about themselves. They love to talk about their business. And so whether you're at a dating seminar or a business seminar, this data has been studied at the neurological level. And so you can get them talking. As an example, I personally go through a three-step sequence. Um, my first step is when the buyer doesn't even know it's happening. It's in the hallway. If it's an in-person meeting, hey, you want a cup of coffee, Mark? Yeah, sure, let's grab a cup of coffee. By the way, I noticed you guys uh, just acquired a company out in Eastern Europe. How's that acquisition going? They're talking. They think it's chit-chat. I'm actually just doing discovery. Okay? If it's a phone call, How's the weather over there? You know, I noticed this particular new hire. How's that integration going? Et cetera, et cetera. They think it's chit chat. I'm doing discovery. That works more than half the time. If that doesn't work, it's just, you know, very simple for a new rep who's nervous. Why'd you take the meeting? Again, really simple opening question. Half the buyers will go talk for 15 minutes. That's a beautiful thing. Okay? Some people will be pissed. 
You, you've probably been there before. Thank you very much, Mr. Witty or Mrs. Witty salesperson. Um, I came here to see your product. Please stop asking me questions and just show me what you got. Okay, fine. I want to be here for you. Now, if I were to show you my product, it would take five hours. You don't have five hours. You're super busy. You have 20 minutes. Most people like you are concerned about one of three things. Either your culture is not doing very good and you're trying to improve it. Number two, you're trying to improve your recruiting uh, function. Or number three, you're trying to you know, build up your Glassdoor profiles. Can you explain which is the biggest priority so I can focus my energy? That's at least giving me some sort of semblance of what they actually want. Okay? So that's all this discovery call does is it takes me through, again, it's not a script, it's just a guide. Let's talk about the awareness stage. What problems do you have? Let's talk about consideration. What have you tried to do? Let's talk about the decision stage. How are you, how are you um, prioritizing your RFP process? How are you prioritizing this decision? And then let's set next steps. Um, so it's not just understanding the buyer, but in my opinion, if the salesperson, if you are a salesperson, understand the why behind these RFP questions is critical. And all the research I've done lately has shown that the buyer doesn't even know why these questions are in here, right? And so that's an opportunity for you to really challenge it and bring this back and avoid losing to a competitor over a stupid question that has nothing to do with the business that they're trying to get out of it. And hopefully that process can be codified through something like the discovery call guide. And then finally presentation, like I finally get my salespeople to like, not be an alligator seller, to ask the questions. They go through this beautiful process. They run a beautiful discovery call. They know exactly where they are on the buying journey, and then they give the same demo to everybody. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Why did we do all that amazing stuff? We gotta tailor this thing. And it's really hard. Like The best salespeople I know, they give 100 demos a year, not one of them's the same. They're all different. Different terminology, they start with different aspects of the company, different aspects of the features. That's hard for a mere mortal to do. And so we have to work on ways to codify that. And so the technique I use, and this is actually, um, this is actually top performance reps. They focus most of the demo and presentation on one topic that happened to be the number one priority of the buyer. They always switch the order. And so that's how, that's how the top performing reps are actually driving that. So what I do is, as I've reflected on, when I reflect on like hundreds of different demos, I saw that like 80% of them fit into one of like three options. And so that's what I do for like newer reps, is I just say like, listen, it could be three options, four options, five options, whatever, I call them swim lanes. And so I establish those swim lanes, and that's a little easier for a mere mortal salesperson to conceptualize is, don't, you don't have to tailor the whole thing, just like do the discovery to figure out which swim lane this buyer is in, and then take them to the swim lane. And the first step of the swim lane is not like, again, I can't tell you how many pitch decks I've seen where the first slide is when our company was started, how many employees we have. That is so bad. The first slide is, this is what we've learned about your business. This is what you're trying to do. Is this right? That's the first slide, right? And then it's completely backing. Fine, then I can tell about the vision of the company. And by the way, I'll probably wordsmith the vision to be aligned with their problem. That's not lying. As long as, as long I'm not lying, I can actually back it up. That's gonna resonate more. I'll include the case studies that work for them, we'll ask for questions and we'll get out of there, okay? So I think the impact, um, uh, impact here, and you guys can play with this stuff, is, um, you know, I, th I think a big part of what Lupio and what I've, I've seen you folks uh, talk about the value here is you're just frustrated and like, you're doing one-off RFP responses. And there probably is a swim lane in this particular stage, whether it's an RFP or a tech response or whatever it might be is you have an opportunity to codify this well, uh, as well in your world, okay? So here's what that step looks like for the top sellers. Again, they're not talking about features. They're talking about features in the sense of value. They're not saying this is what this button does, this is what this button does for your business. And they're getting more questions. So you, you folks are probably all, all involved at this stage. If you're getting more questions, your likelihood of buying is going way up. It's a good thing, take the time. Right, take the time, that's what the top performers are actually getting. Here's how they're doing with price. The bottom performers at this stage bring up price early, top performers, the price happens at the end. You know, they're, they're asking early, but they're deflecting it. I don't know, it's probably gonna be between 100 and 150,000 a year. And I always price something a little higher than it actually is. And so later on, once I, it depends what you need, let's get through what you need first, then I'll come pitch, oh by the way, it's 75,000. It's at the end, it's posed in value. Okay? And the way they're handling objections, every objection, 
is handle the question. Does your product do X, Y, Z? Well, hold on, before I answer that, let me just clarify, what do you mean by X, Y, Z? I'm going through three or four questions. I'm learning what exactly they mean, why they're asking that question, and why it's important. And that's, that's how the top performers are handling these obje objections uh, at this stage of the buying process. Okay? So here's my mental map. Here's my mental map on what this happens. This is, uh, you know, I've read Spin Selling and Challenger Sale and all those ones. I love them. I learned a ton from them. But this is just the way I summarize it is your first journey is understand the buyer context and then you're either aligned with the number one priority of your buyer or you're not. If you're aligned with the number one priority of your buyer and you can solve that, just tear the pitch and win. And if you're not, the mental exercise you have to do, in my opinion, is you have to pretend if you quit your job and you took over that person's job, you became, sat in that buyer's seat, do you agree with them? They are prioritizing a problem that you don't fit. Your competitor is a better fit for the way they're defining their problem. If you quit your job and took over their job, would you agree? If you do, walk away. Walk away. Ask them for a reference. Recommend, a, not, probably not a competitor, but recommend someone that will help them. It'll come back to you well in the end. But if you don't agree, then you have to reframe their perspective. And you're being, that's a good thing to do as long as you're truthful with yourself, as if you took over their job and they're wrong. Now, reframing doesn't mean like telling them you're wrong. That's not gonna work, right? So usually it's like a provocative question to get them thinking combined with sharing some data around a case study and hopefully they come around. Usually you know when like someone's like, you know what, no one's really ever asked me that question before. That's a great question. You just reframe it. When someone says to you, no one's ever asked me that question before, you just re reframe their perspective. So that's essentially the, the mental map that I think about and how I figure the discovery and the presentation. And I think for you folks, it's like, don't be afraid to walk away. I will tell you for the, 100 or so RFPs that I personally have done, more than half of them, my first call to the buyer was, I'm, and I know this is cheesy and you probably all do it, and maybe you work with more sophisticated buyers, but it worked for me, is I'm sorry, but I'm pulling my company out of the running for this RFP. And they freaked out. And they asked, well, why are you doing that? And I said, because it's not written in a way that's gonna create business value for you. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And bam, I'm right in there. I'm right in the reframing. And I know that's, the, you, know, you guys deal with the government, that kind of stuff. They probably you know, see through that. But it's an example of like, you know, don't chase yourself through a process that you're not gonna win. And you've gotta make sure this thing's framed around um, the buyer journey perspective and the framework that we talked about. Okay. And just so you know, how does this information track into the salespeople we're hiring? This is actually, um, uh, I, I'm a graduate of MIT and I gave all this, um, I started amassing all this data around hiring my salespeople and I started to quantify them uh, through the interview process. And I quantified all these different measurements. And then over time, I hired enough of these people that I actually had one of my buddies do a regression analysis, which like these MIT PhDs, they love it when they can do a regression analysis. And so this was a regression analysis that uh, we first did, where the big bars to the right were the, the attributes that were correlated with success, and the big bars to the left were negatively correlated. And it's crazy that like things we associate with that car salesperson I showed a picture of, closing, convincing, objection handling, they were negatively correlated. And the stuff like that we'd associate with like a great consultant or advisor, preparation, domain experience, that was the strongest correlation. So for those of you who are building teams, this set a um, huge signal for me and the culture that I wanted to build um, in, my, in my salespeople. And this is sort of the progression that I see them go through is they, I work with them, they show up and throw up in level one, and they're like, oh, I get it. I, like, my MBA students, they're, they're not, they, the MBA students, and I was an MBA, I sucked at selling when I was an MBA. And they don't, they really don't know how to sell. They think that selling is the show up and throw up. And this is sort of the sequence that I take them through. Like, oh yeah, number two, it's about questions, but they ask these closed ended questions. Like, do you have a problem with your culture? Not a good question. Right? So they're, oh yeah, it's about open ended questions. But they ask one or two, and eventually they get to like sequential ones, eventually they get to be able to tailor their pitch, and then they be able to reframe. So this is where I'm trying to get all my salespeople to. I can probably get half of them there, and it takes like six to 12 months. But that's the journey that I'm trying to get them to. And this, like really tactically speaking, 
It starts with the opening training. Think about, I don't know if you've been to your opening sales training, how much of it is about your product? How much is it about your buyer? All the sales training is about the product. So we're like wiring these people. Like honestly at HubSpot, 70% of the first month, we had all of our salespeople, so we sold marketing software. Um, we had all our salespeople create a blog, write blog articles, do a social media like, campaign, send them to a landing page. They did marketing. And by the time they were on the phone with their first marketer who was skeptical that this stuff worked, they literally brought up their site and said, no, I did this. And so are there innovative ways that you can include in your training let your, your sellers walk in the shoes of your buyer. Because personally, I think that's going to be more impactful on the readiness and preparation of those folks than just plain old product training. Okay. All right, so, so just to, to sum up that, that particular piece, I've looked around for like a good analogy on who I aspire to as a salesperson. And the best one I've come up with is like a good doctor. Like literally, like I show up at the doctor's office and I... I you know, explain what's going on, and what does she do? She, she like asks me questions, right? She's like, well, how does this hurt? Like, I broke my hand golfing, believe it or not. And so like, you know, I go through the process, and she's like um, asking me questions. Like, hey, do you smoke? Do you drink? Like, how much? And like, you tell the truth, because you see the diploma on the wall, and you know she's just trying to diagnose your situation. That's really what we should be doing in sales. And when she's like, here's what you have, take these pills, I'm not like, let me think about it or can I get 20% off? You know what I mean? Like I take the pills because she has my best interest in mind. And like from my perspective, that's like the best I can do and like where we need to be as a sales function and where I aspire to be in terms of getting my teams there. Okay? So it's interesting, um, this was a, um, I find a lot of companies, I don't know how many of you as you look around your office, are you organized by function or are you organized by buyer? And I know like as we scaled up HubSpot, we got to like 200 people at this point. And um, we had like, uh, it was the first time that we were finally on different floors. And we had marketing over there, and we had sales over there, and we had services upstairs. And I, start, I ran all three of these groups. And I started to see that like, these groups started to have a different definition of what a good customer was. Like marketing was solving for people that it was easy to get to fill out a form because that was their job. Sales was like people who was easy to get their credit card because that was their job. And then services were people who they, they liked the folks that were easy to make them successful in the product. And so as we grew, I, I had the choice of either trying to put in all these rules or just blow the whole thing up and reorganize around the bottom. And that's what we did. And I know that many organizations have gone back and forth on very different org structures to try to fix things. But I see more people having success with smaller cross-functional pods because of this change in buyer value. Like, we can't get away with just, like, pitching the stuff that's on our website. And I know that's been a big thing for, for you all as well in terms of, like, how do I tap into the right expert? Well, if your seller is always selling to this segment of the government or is always selling to this vertical, they know the subject matter expert on that person. They know the case studies. They know the last 15 you know, security uh, surveys that were filled out on this particular segment. And so it worked exceptionally well um, for me. This is actually a company that sells to both brokers and landlords, and they actually created a different buyer journey for the two to help these specialized teams to really hone in on that buyer. So I just wonder as you, I know you've got a session on collaboration today, um, I just wonder if there has been experimentation with smaller cross-functional pods that are specialized not by function, but by buyer type. And whether that can help um, to accelerate some of the values of the software as well. And so, you know, that, what we've been talking about is the, the modern buyer shift, but there's also this big data shift too. Like we've gone from how do I get the data in sales to what do I do with all this data? We've gone from, like CRM adoption has gone really high. And maybe, maybe it's still a struggle in your companies, but like many companies are having much more luck with CRM adoption. The technology's gotten better, more teams are inside. And so we've got this huge amount of data that we can lean onto. 
And in the same way that this empowered buyer drives great innovations, this big data play drives big um, uh, uh, integrations as well. And so this is, this is one that like, I've seen businesses completely transform the way that they coach their people. So in my opinion, a, man a sales manager, most of the sales managers I find spend all their time putting together the forecast. And that's what technology can do. Sales managers should hire and coach, hire and coach. That's what they spend most of their time doing. And we have an opportunity to lean into the data more to diagnose our own reps and their deficiencies. So this is a simple like five person team. This is last quarter's performance. And each color is a different rep, you can see. How many millions they ran, how many got to the RFP, how many got to the signed contract, and how much bookings they did. So Anna in the green and Fred in the purple both missed their number. Their, their goal was 300,000 for the quarter. And they miss it for very different reasons. I mean, Anna's crushing the activity, getting tons of first meetings. She's just not getting them down to the, um, the, the later stages. Whereas Fred's just struggling with his activity in, in general. So without the data, these reps would have been coached in the same way. But this, given the data, I now can coach my people very differently. And I talked to a few of you last night that you're thinking about doing some of this stuff with the data that, you know, you can now track within your RFP responses to see differences in performances. And so this is what I hold my managers accountable to is every month I ask them to submit their coaching plans. With each rep, what's your diagnosis, what's the coaching plan, and how will you measure success? Because we have that in the data now. If I'm gonna coach someone on developing sense of urgency with my prospects, I can see in the data that that's gonna change. So I can hold my managers accountable to coaching and hold my team accountable to receiving that coaching. I run film reviews to do this. And I heard that some of you are doing this with your RFP calls as well. And so what I do is, um, when, I, when I start working with a, a new company that's rolling out a new product, and they have to figure out all this new stuff, the buyer journey, the discovery call guide, we put together a theory of this, this playbook. And then we run a daily film review to see if it works. So each day, a different rep is on the hot seat to record a call and they show up to this meeting at five o'clock for an hour to listen to the call as a team. And in advance, I say, okay, you're on the hot seat. Uh, Joe, you're in charge of uh, positive feedback, and Mary, you're in charge of need for improvement feedback, in advance. So we're not like attacking this person. It's like, there's some good stuff I'm taking away, and there's some needs for improvement. And so we listen to it, and then we go around. We always let the, the salesperson self-assess first, then we give them the positive feedback, then we do the needs for improvement, and then we open up. And what we're basically trying to understand is, number one, was our playbook right? Because I'm never gonna get the playbook right out of the bag. So did that work for this particular buyer? And if it didn't, it was because this buyer is like, just weird? Or is it that we've just got the playbook wrong? And then did we execute it well? And so this is where, really where we're at, the, the level of science that we can run our sales processes on. And I've seen a lot of you trying to push the envelope in your your procurement, your RFP, or your security teams. And that's an opportunity for you, I think, in the next two days to try to push the envelope on this test learn. We all talk agile, agile, agile. Agile's been great in product, now they're bringing to go to market. And we have an opportunity to like, run a number of experiments, we've got access to all this data, and to set up as leaders, test learn and iterate cycles to just get better every quarter within that functions. All right, last thing I'll leave you with is, um, in preparation here, I actually Googled, have you ever Googled the history of the RFP? <laughs> so I Googled. It's not pictures of salespeople. Um, so yeah, this dude here wrote it's the first book. Uh, Marshall Kirkman mentioned the RFP is like 1860. And so what happened, it makes sense logically. You think about the history of North America. Um, you know, it, it was all, like people were building stuff and they needed materials. And up until like the railroad, you basically just went to the guy in your town that sold that material. Like everyone knew each other. And then what happened was they started creating railroads and it became, we created the first national companies. So now you had like the, the expert provider of steel and it was someone you didn't know anymore. And so you had to have like an RFP to help with the ambiguity. And, and, and that's kind of what we, what we went through was we went from this sequence like 150 years ago, where it's just like, yeah, I just go to Joe, he has the best steel in town, 
to like, I don't know who has the best deal. And, and so I have sort of like, I'm just gonna go with whoever's the best deal and deal with it. But now we've kind of swung back. We've swung back because we have all this information access with the internet. We have a high degree of need for personalized material. And like the other thing that you see when you Google RFP is the words waste of time. <laughs> and I think like it's very appropriate with the LubyCon, you know, focus on what matters is this is probably one of the, the biggest um, what matters is, you know, just really challenging. Are we in love with this like 120 year old process just because of it? And I know you guys are the sellers, not the buyers. But I just wonder if, if as the, the sellers, you can't help to innovate. Um, that's kind of, I think you're going to go through this an exciting time for the loopers and hopefully for you. You know, it's probably the, the only time you've come together with peers like this physically to brainstorm. And I think you're going to come away with a lot of extremely tangible items. I remember the first inbound we did was just like this. And now it's 20,000 people. And we benchmarked ourselves against the Dreamforce. And I, I do believe that that's what this could happen. And the reason why inbound became so popular is be, and people made time to come is because you have an opportunity to redefine this field. It sounds cheesy, but you really do. And so I think a page in this whole history can be defined in the next two days. And I just encourage you, in addition to the tactical stuff, think bigger. Think bigger about this whole RFP thing. Is it really right given everything we have in terms of technology and information exchange? And what are we trying to achieve as a buyer, as the buyer? And as a seller, can we try to influence that disruption? So I will, I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Questions. I, what I did was I threw up a couple. Again, I haven't, you folks are the experts in your teams. I have studied extremely closely how these themes and trends in buying impact how we sell. I personally have not studied how they impact how we respond to tech. Uh, you know, security questionnaires and RFPs. I've suggested ways that I've seen you folks do it. But I'm open to any questions. This is just a reminder on some of the stuff here. Please don't be shy, the first one's the hardest. Raise your hand, we'll have some mics going around. Keep your hand up so we can get them. Who's got one? Anything. Go, yeah, go ahead. Here, here's the mic, hold on one second. Thanks. Yes, right in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that's, that's what we uh, typically think of. I'm not a salesperson. What's your role? Uh, I'm in cybersecurity. Okay, cool. Um, wait, 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 and you're, you're on the security team? Your, your yes. role in the company? Cool, okay. Yes, yes. Um, one, of, one of the things I wanted to call out, though, was the empathy. You, yes. You, you talked about the empathy for yes. yourself in the buyer's shoes, and I think that's, that's critical. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's funny that you bring that up because if you do Google my name and empathy, there was a Forbes article written about my, um, my drive. They were the one that kind of coined what I've been saying around empathy. And it's funny, I probably should push on that more, is um, trying to diagnose the em how empathetic um, people are. I think I define it mostly as curiosity in my assessment process, which is the number two Selection criteria for the salespeople I look at. My number one is coachability, actually. I set up like a highly coaching, you can see like an emphasis on the scientific method and test, learn, and iterate, and it takes a coachable person. But curiosity is another one. I, may, I probably should push it harder on, on empathy. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, good. Keep your hand up, actually, if you have us. We've we got a couple mics going on. Yep. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I think this comes in a lot of different flavors depending on your context as to whether you have access to the buyer or whether that's done through a salesman, but somebody has to do that. So I'll take two extremes. One extreme is you're highly reliant, you have very little access to the buyer, um, you're highly reliant on your seller, and I think it's you pushing. And I know that's hard because you're essentially telling them how to sell. And I'm telling you that 80% of professional salespeople, I don't think know how to sell, right? And so um, just find a way, whether you've got a good relationship or not, is like we really need to understand the why behind this before I can adequately. And the good news is you're all on the same team that you want that deal, okay? Now, um, in terms of uh, if you do have access to the buyer, um, that's a good question because um, the classic, the classic, um, the classic process to getting access to power is to ask the, if you feel like you're dealing with someone that doesn't truly have decision making power, the best way to address that is to ask them an important question that they don't know the answer to, and then ask who does know the answer. And I wonder if there's a parallel here with this why, is, um, you know, I'd imagine that for a lot of these cases, your contact may not know the reason, and perhaps just challenge them, do you know who might? And that would give you broader access to the decision power in the organization, which will only help you in that pursuit, and to be able to like, understand how important that question is. Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, right here. I'm sorry, right here. Um, I'm Christopher Joe from Sprinkler. I, um, you mentioned at the, at the kind of the tail end, you were talking about um, the call that you might make to um, someone submitting an RFP when you would say, I'm yeah. going to pull my company out of the RFP. Yeah. I, my question is, do you, like, would, is that an approach you would take kind of every time just to pull, like, to understand where they're at? Or is that something that you have, like, a criteria? I do. I personally, if, if I can get away without coming off as cheesy or if like, if, if you know, I'll try to get a sense if my buyer is going to see through that or not, but I will almost all the time want a, an approach like that. And I'll tell you, even outside of RFPs, like I've given 200 times more demonstrations. All of my, and this is just a psychological thing, um, it's a little bit of like, I don't want to say sleaziness, but uh, let, me, let, me, let me counter the sleazy part. Um, when I do good discovery, and then I'm going to switch gears to, let me make sure I understand what you're trying to solve and then start telling you what I do, I usually say, we're not really a good fit for you. I do. And that tees me up to, first off, be able to reframe where they're off because they're curious. They are also like, there's this negative like, psychology that like, they're used to saying no to salespeople, and now all of a sudden they're like, Wait a minute, how dare you say you're not a good fit for me? You know what I mean? And so it's like, so again, so it's just, it's a little, and that's what I'm kind of doing with the RP, as long as they're not going to see it as cheesy, okay? Um, and it also kind of gets us on the same side of the table, right? So the only reason I personally don't, I feel good about it and not sleazy about it is because I went through the mental exercise that I talked about of like putting myself in the buyer's shoes. If I were them, I would want my stuff. Right? I'm not going to sell them if I'm, if I'm not. So now my job is to get that in their hands because it's going to make their job and their company better. If I can feel confident about that, then I don't feel bad about the, I'm just going through the process of reframing. So, other questions? Yeah, there. Hi, Michael. Uh, Michael from uh, Hey, Michael. So I guess to follow up with this uh, question about discovery and Mm -hmm. Push more. Sure. The people actually do it and try to be more objective. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this sort of, ugh, that's a tough one. I mean, you're obviously your salesperson has to be aligned. I'd probably, in a way, like, first off, try to get them on board with it. This is, this is some of the, the sales coaching that I, I will do with folks is like the best sellers are the best qualifiers and people fall into potholes when they push stuff through too deeply. Um, so I might try to go around that model. I may try to escalate it to their manager who may have like a broader view on the broader opportunities. But like, 
I think it's a really good question, especially if you're dealing with a salesperson who has literally their territory as two accounts. <laughs> you know, it's like um, you kind of have to be going down a reframing uh, model there. So you kind of almost have to be going down that approach. So the reason why I'm taking this is not to literally walk away from the deal, but just make sure we're positioned in a way that we can win. So I understand in, in context as this can be challenging. All right, question there. Hi, uh, Bill Rain from MasterCard. Hey, Bill. The, the um, how do you uh, balance? There's when somebody's got a commodified product, and you've got pricing as a very heavy consideration in the decision making. And a lot of what we talk about here is uh, capabilities based and differentiation based. And there is a lot of that in our business, but there's also some commodification. So, where do you see that fitting into the overall pattern of uh, RFP responses in particular, but also in the sales cycle? Why? Why do people? Why should people go with Mastercard and not Visa or Amex? Oh, we have a ton of differentiation in give me the top lines and stuff like that. But I will tell you that the judgment is very frequently driven by financial. Yes. Uh, and do you win? Are you the lowest cost provider? Do, are there reasons why you can deliver the best price? Uh, it depends, and, and the answer is not all the time. Yeah. And sure. sometimes we don't win those. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. You know, how do you how do you balance that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, you see where we're getting at, and it's just like in. Um, I I don't feel like a lot of, and I think you guys, you you have smart people working, you know, thinking through this, but like, um, smaller businesses fail to appreciate what true, unique, sustainable differentiation is. And um, when you're going down the commodity route, um, you know, there's, it might be a race to the bottom, and if you have particular reasons why um, you can deliver on a lower cost provider more than anyone else, then I think you should flaunt that. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think what you're basically saying is it, is it, does, it does depend. Um, and the classic answer, and my best, men, my best mentors in sales has always been like, he's always strategic around what is the unique sustainable differentiation? What is this with this account? And then how do I refrain someone around it? And it's hard for me to say that if it's like completely commoditized, it's like you're gonna lose the ones where you don't have unique advantage and you're gonna win the ones when you do, but I've never seen an organization play to their strengths every time. So I feel like that's our journey, is making sure that we're understanding what that true unique differentiation, if in some cases we can be the low cost provider, great, let's flaunt it. If in other cases it's because of the, the breadth of our offering, great, let's flaunt it. But our job is to make sure that the sales team is playing the game properly as often as possible, because we're never gonna play it perfect, right? We got another one here, dude? This will be the last one I'll close out for you guys. Okay, we'll do two more. Okay, good. Good. Hello. Whoa, there you go. This is uh, Eric. I'm a uh, focus. Hey, uh, Eric. A quick question about in your experience with some of the data interviews, especially, is there a certain amount of time that you will pull the field out to do training, enablement, mm. interviews, and things like that that get into the, you know, yeah, sure. So like new, new product coming out to do something or like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean a couple, couple of things there. First off, um, I think we all know that like we tend to over uh, play our hands at how effective sales training is going to be. Okay, so like the adoption rate is not exceptional. So I don't do as much mass training, nor do I advise much mass training because you saw the information I saw up there with Aaron and Fred or Anna and Fred, they had very different diagnoses. So I much, I much rather solve for coaching my managers to be great trainers and to be able to pull the right coaching model at the right time. Because I do find that like, great coaching is the ability, like I often draw the analogy to golf ironically, that like I've taken lessons and one golf pro said take a swing and He's like, okay, turn your grip over, lean back in your stance, put more weight in your right foot, not your left. Think one o'clock, not two o'clock on the backswing and give me more wrist on contact. And I'm like, what the hell? You know what I mean? So that's how a lot of coaching happens. And it's like, it's the wrong stuff at the wrong time and it's really the focus on one. So my, one of my answers is I tend to solve for enabling the frontline managers to be great one-on-one coaches more so than I do mass training, okay? 
Now, when you roll out a new product, you gotta do it, right? So when I roll out a new product and I, um, I, I, I really push organizations to not like, they, they, they tend to like, okay, we have to make a, uh, an annual earnings number, so let's develop a new product and let's enable the sales team in parallel with developing the product. So we train 500 reps to do this. And honestly, we waste a ton of time because we don't know how to solve this thing, right? So what I, what I instead like is let's, let's pull out like a SWAT team, an overlay team, to figure out how to sell this product. I don't know if it's gonna take a month, two months, six months, whatever. And let's like almost double comp the, the system and figure it out. I got a small number of brains doing all my at bats. And then once I understand how to do it, I can train the rest of the team. And what's nice about that is, as you go through that process, everyone on the team has probably seen that overlay team come in and do one of those product pitches, so they're naturally actually learning through the process. But I have greater confidence that what I'm gonna teach them on is actually vetted, okay? So those are my, my two plays when I do that. All right, we'll do the last question here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, we're almost to my start, and I also have a sales training related question. So, um, demos. Yes. We're trying to scale our demo sales training across the organization right now. Do you have any tips for that in terms of the focusing on topics? And yes. Training? I imagine the swim lane analogy will go a long way for you. So that's what I would do is, um, what I might do is, I'd probably get access to as many specific examples. I, I don't know if the demos are done on the phone or in person. Are they on the phone? Okay, cool. So you, you, can, you can use some of the software to like really record these, these demonstrations, check your local laws on notifying the buyer that this can happen, and, and work with someone who really knows the sales process development, um, and, and kind of like literally like, what would have been the perfect demo for this buyer? Do that like 10, 20 times, it'll be worth it. I think you'll find that you can codify it into like three to five swim lanes, that you can then go back and do. And now that represents like a, a different presentation flow um, for those various things. And that's like the starting point for a mere mortal rep to be able to feel like we're delivering a customized experience, okay? So with that, I'll get you guys to coffee. There's one last story I'll share with you. I, I, I had the opportunity to um, you know, talk to some of you last night. I know there's a lot of new parents in the room. And so I had a great parenting moment this weekend um, where my son, he was having trouble sleeping. And I told him, you know, Kai, He's 12 years old, I was like, you know what I do when I have trouble sleeping is I, I read a book and that tends to put me to sleep. Now this can't be an exciting book because you know, you'll get into it. It has to be kind of a boring book. So I have these boring books that I, I read and it puts me to sleep. He goes, Dad, thank you so much, he gave me a hug. He went into the living room and to the bookshelf and grabbed a book. I grabbed some water, kind of smiled, good parenting moment. I come back, he's on the couch reading my book. <laughs> and so, like true story. And he was asleep in five minutes. Um, but in all honesty, um, so I, as, as uh, Zach said, I, I wrote this book after the HubSpot experience, um, and which you can check out if you like some of the stuff I talked about. 100% of the proceeds go to a nonprofit called Build. Um, I'm a passion entrepreneur, and what these folks do, my friend Ayeli is their CEO, um, across North America, I think 15 different cities, they choose the worst performing high schools in these cities, really tough environments, kids that didn't have the deck that we were dealt in life, and they teach them entrepreneurship and they put them through a four year program and the graduation rate for these kids out of high school is like 99%, 85% go to college, that is like twice as high as the average for those high schools. So I just wanna let you know, if you do uh, check out the book, you're also uh, helping that org. Um, congrats to the loopers here. This is again, I'm a passion entrepreneur and I love to see and help passion entrepreneurs. This is the beginning of a movement. I just feel for you guys, I'm like glowing. So I know what this moment feels like and congratulations and Thank you, everyone, uh, for helping this moment occur. Take care.